Let's go ahead with chapter 3 of The Sword in the Stone by T.H. White. The wart slept well in the woodland nest where he had laid himself down, in that kind of thin but refreshing sleep which people have when they first lie out of doors. At first he only dipped below the surface of sleep and skimmed along like a salmon in shallow water, so close to the surface that he fancied himself in air. He thought himself awake when he was already asleep. He saw the stars above his face whirling around on their silent and sleepless axis, and the leaves of the trees rustling against them, and heard small changes in the grass. These little noises of footsteps and soft fringed wing beats and stealthy bellies drawn over the grass blades or rattling against the bracken at first frightened, at first frightened or interested him, so that he moved to see what they were, but never saw, then soothed him, so that he no longer cared to see what they were, but trusted them to be themselves and finally left him altogether as he swam down deeper and deeper, nuzzling his nose into the scented turf, into the warm ground, into the unending waters under the earth. It had been difficult to go to sleep in the bright summer moonlight, but once he was there it was not difficult to stay. The sun came early, causing him to turn over in protest, but in going to sleep he had learned to vanquish light, and now the light could not rewake him. It was nine o'clock, five hours after daylight, before he rolled over, opened his eyes, and was awake. At once, he was hungry. The wart had heard about people who lived on berries, but this did not seem practical at the moment, because it was July, and there were none. He found two wild strawberries and ate them greedily. They tasted nicer than anything, so he wished there were more. Then he wished it was April, so that he could find some bird's eggs and eat those or that he had not lost his goshawk cully, so that the bird could catch him a rabbit, which he would cook by rubbing two sticks together, like the base Indian. But he had lost cully, or he would not have lost himself, and probably the sticks would not have lighted in any case. He decided that he would have gone more than three or four miles from, that he could not have gone more than three or four miles from home, so that the best thing he could do would be to sit still and listen. Then he might hear the noise of haymakers, if he was lucky with the wind, and could hearken his way home by that. What he did hear was a faint clanking noise, which made him think of King Pel that King Pelinore must be after the questing beast again close by. Only the noise was so regular and single in intention that it made him think of King Pelinore doing some special action with great patience and concentration, trying to scratch his back without taking off his armor, for instance. He went toward the noise. There was a clearing in the forest, and in this clearing there was a snug little cottage built of stone. It was a cottage, although the wart did not notice it, this at the time, which was divided into two bits. The main bit was the hall, or every purpose room, which was high because it extended from floor to roof. And this room had a fire on the floor whose smoke issued eventually out of a hole in the thatch of the roof. The other half of the cottage was divided into two rooms by a horizontal floor, which made the top half into a bedroom and study, while the bottom half served as a larder, storeroom, stable, and barn. A white donkey lived in this downstairs room, and a ladder led to the one upstairs. There was a well in front of the cottage, and the metallic noise which the wart had heard was caused by a very old gentleman who was drawing water out of it by means of a handle and chain. Clank, 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 said the chain, until the bucket hit the lip of the well, and... Oh, drag the whole thing, said the old gentleman. You would think that after all these years of study, one could do better for oneself than buy Our Lady well with a buy Our Lady bucket, whatever the buy Our Lady cost. I wish to goodness, added the old gentleman, heaving his bucket out of the well with a malevolent glance, that I was the only that I was only on the, on the electric light and the company's water, drat it! The old gentleman that the wart saw was a singular spectacle. He was dressed in flowing gowns with fur tippets, which had the signs of the zodiac embroidered all over it, together with various cabalistic signs as of triangles with eyes in them, queer crosses, leaves of trees, bones of birds, and animals, and a planetarium whose stars shone like bits of looking glass with the sun on them. He had a pointed hat like a dunce's cap, 
or like the headgear worn by ladies of that time, except that the ladies were accustomed to have a bit of veil floating from the top of it. He also had a wand of lingam, vitae, which he had laid down on the grass beside him, and a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles like those of King Pellinore. They were extraordinary spectacles, being without earpieces, but shaped rather like scissors or the antennae of a tarantula wasp. "'Excuse me, sir,' said the ward, "'but can you tell me the way to Sir Ector's castle, if you don't mind?' The aged gentleman put down his bucket and looked at the ward. "'Your name would be Wart, he said. "'Yes, sir, please, sir,' said the ward. "'My name,' said the aged gentleman, "'is Merlin.' "'How do you do?' said the ward. "'How do you do?' said Merlin. "'It is the clement weather, is it not?' "'It is,' said the ward. For, this for the time of the year. When these formalities had been concluded, the wart had leisure to examine his new acquaintance more closely. The aged gentleman was staring at him with a kind of unwinking and benevolent curiosity which made him feel that it would not at all be rude to stare back, no ruder than it would be to stare at one's guardian's cows who happened to be ruminating his personality as she leaned her head over a gate. Merlin had a long white beard and long white mustaches which hung down on either side of it, and close inspection showed that he was far from clean. It was not that he had dirty fingernails or anything like that, but some large bird seemed to have been nesting in his hair. The wart was familiar with the nests of Sparhawk and Goss, those crazy conglomerations of sticks and oddments which had been taken from the squirrels and crows, and he knew how twigs and the tree foot were splashed with white mutes, old bones, muddy feathers, and castings. This was the impression which he gathered from Merlin, the old gentleman streaked with droppings over his shoulder among the stars and triangles of his gown, and a large spider was slowly lowering himself from the tip of his hat as he gazed slowly, blinked at the little boy in front of him. He had a faintly worried expression, as though he were trying to remember some name which began with Chal, but might be pronounced in quite a different way, possibly Menzies, or was it Dalziel, his mild blue eyes, very big and round, under the, under the tarantula spectacles, gradually filmed and clouded over as he gazed at the boy, and then he turned his head away with a resigned expression, as though it was all too much for him after all. "'Do you like peaches?' asked the old gentleman. "'Very much indeed,' answered the wart, with, and his mouth began to water so that it was full of sweet, soft liquid. "'It is only July, you know,' said the old man reprovingly, and walked off in the direction of the cottage without looking round. The wart followed after him, since this was the simplest thing to do, and offered to carry the bucket, which seemed to please the old gentleman who gave it to him, and waited while he counted his keys and muttered and mislaid them and dropped them in the grass. Finally, when he had got the, when they had got their way into the black and white cottage, with as much trouble as if they were burgling it, he climbed up the ladder after his host and found himself in the upstairs room. It was the most marvelous room the wart had ever been in. There was a real cock and drill hanging from the rafters, very lifelike and horrible, with glass eyes and scaly tail stretched out behind it. When its master came into the room, it winked one eye in salutation, although it was stuffed. There were hundreds of thousands of brown books and leather bindings, some chained to the bookshelves and others propped up against each other, as if they had, been t as if they had had too much spirits to drink and did not really trust themselves. These gave out a smell of must and solid brownness, which was most secure. Then there were stuffed birds, popinjays, and maggot pies, and kingfishers and peacocks with all their feathers but two, and tiny birds like beetles, and a reputed f and the a reputed phoenix which smelt of incense and cinnamon. It could not have been a real phoenix because there was only one of the, these at a time. Over by a mantelpiece, over by the mantelpiece, there was a fox's mask with Grafton, Buckingham to Daventry, two hours twenty minutes written under it. There was also a 40-pound salmon with awe, 30, 43 minutes, bulldog written under it, and a very lifelike basilisk with crowhurst, otterhounds in Roman print. There were several boar's tusks in the claws of tigers and libbards, 
mounted in symmetrical patterns in the big head of Ovis Polly, six live grass snakes in a kind of aquarium, some nests of a solitary wasp nicely set up in a glass cylinder, an ordinary beehive whose inhabitants went in and out of the window unmolested, two young hedgehogs in cotton wool, a pair of badgers which immediately began to cry, yik, 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 in loud voices as soon as the magician appeared, twenty boxes which contained stick caterpillars, and six of the pus mouth, uh, and six of the pus moth, and even an oleander that was worth two and six, all feeding on the appropriate leaves. A gun case with all sorts of weapons, which would not be invented for half a thousand years. A rod box, ditto. A lovely chest of drawers full of salmon files, or full of salmon flies, which had been tied by Merlin himself. Another chest whose drawers were labeled. Mandragata, mandrake, old man's beard, etc., a box of turkey feathers and goose quills for making pens, an astrolabe, twelve pairs of boots, a dozen purse nets, three dozen rabbit wires, twelve corkscrews, an ant's nest between two glass plates, ink bottles of every possible color from red to velvet, darning needles, a gold medal for being the best scholar at Eton, four or five recorders, a nest of field mice, all alive-o, two skulls, plenty of cut glass, Venetian glass, Bristol glass, a bottle of mastic varnish, some some satsuma china, and some clothesny, a 14th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, marred as it was by the sensation of the popular plates, two paint boxes, one oil, one watercolor, three globes of the known geographical world, a few fossils, a, the stuffed head of a camelopard, six pest myers, some glass... Res- Retorts with cauldrons, Bunsen burners, etc., and a complete set of cigarette cards depicting wild fowl by Peter Scott. Merlin took off his pointed hat when he came into this extraordinary chamber because it was too high for the roof, and immediately there was a little scamper in one of the dark corners, and a flap of soft wings, and a young tawny owl was sitting on a black skull cap which protected the top of his head. Oh, what a lovely owl! cried the wart. But when he went up to it and held out his hand, the owl grew half as tall again and stood up as stiff as a poker, closed its eyes so that there was only the smallest slit to peep through, as one, in the, as one is in the habit of doing when told to shut one's eyes at hide-and-seek and said in a dubious voice, There is no owl! Then it shut its eyes entirely and looked the other way. It's only a boy, said Merlin. There is no boy, said the owl, hopefully, without turning round. And we will pause there.